For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson, with the latest readout video from our free Wednesday wake-up email newsletter, to which you should subscribe, as you should subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And with climate fever. Uh, no, not me personally. I'm cool, man. Rather, according to Scientific American, valley fever will eat California because of climate change. Yeah, it's not high taxes, crime, or unreliable energy due to wacky climate policy that's causing people to flee the Golden State. Instead, quote, the flooding caused by intensifying winter rainstorms in California is helping to spread a deadly fungal disease called cochidioidomycosis, or valley fever, end quote. Which loves wet and dry weather, and now California has both, unlike in the past when it alternated flooding and droughts. Hey, wait a minute. Uh, the piece explains that doom looms as usual, quote, hydroclimate whiplash is increasingly wide springs between extremely wet and extremely dry conditions, said Daniel Swain, a climate scientist at University of California, Los Angeles. Humans are finding it difficult to adapt to this new pattern, but fungi are thriving, Swain said. Valley fever, he added, is going to become an increasingly big story, end quote. Oh man, hydroclimate whiplash, that's brutal. So, never mind that this new valley fever is named for California's San Joaquin Valley, quote, where the disease was discovered in a farm worker in the late 1800s, end quote. But, to be fair, nowadays thousands of cases turn up in a year among just 39 million people. The piece also asserts that, quote, until last year's series of drought-busting atmospheric rivers, California was in the throes of a long-term drought pattern. 2000 to 2021 was the driest two-decade st stretch in the Southwest in 12 centuries. Climate models predict the Golden State will endure more droughts in the future, end quote. Now, the first part of that is untrue. Here's a 2,000-year precipitation proxy for locations along the California and Oregon coasts, with each dot representing a moving 30-year average and the year 1900 marked by a vertical line. As you can see, the final 800 years show a steady decline, which obviously had its origin in natural causes. And whatever's happening in the 20th century is well within the range of values shown in the past when there were no greenhouse gases to blame. It's just natural variability. As to ranting and raving that, quote, as far as we know and in the natural course of events, our world has never in its entire history heated up as rapidly as it is doing now, end quote, that's just plain false. The planet certainly warmed faster at the end of the younger, driest cold spell. It may have gone up 5 degrees Celsius in a century or less. And we don't have proxies for previous periods. That younger dries is in the Holocene. You go back to the Cretaceous, we have no idea what kind of jumps in temperature might have happened over a period of a century. Unfortunately, journalists just don't do fact checks these days. If they did, especially using our resources, they'd know that there was so much rain in California in 1850 that Sacramento became a second Venice. And then a 10-year drought basically wiped out all the cattle in Southern and Central California those being the good old days of mild weather and no fungus. Hey, you 40 percenters. I know you're out there. You're the 40% who are watching but haven't yet subscribed to the channel. And I want to ask you, please, to click this button and get us from 84,000 to 100,000 subscribers in the next two months. It doesn't cost you anything. It helps us grow the climate discussion nexus and it helps protect us against getting deplatformed. So just click here and we'll get back to the show. In the newsletter, we also note that if you want to make yourself popular, and then ridiculous, one proven method is to predict an ice-free Arctic in the near future. You can watch our Prophets of Doom video for a recap of the long line of failed Arctic melting predictions. But where angels fear to tread, a new study in nature rushes in with, yeah, this time for sure, by the 2030s or 2050, could be earlier, maybe between 2035 and 2067 or perhaps 2100. Thanks for that. We also note that a committee of experts just voted down the notion that the Holocene epoch has ended and the Anthropocene has begun due to humanity's general awfulness. But don't expect us here at CDN to be popping any corks, and not only because we think that the notion of the Holocene as a separate epoch rather than just one more interglacial is misleading as well as vainglorious. The main point here is that science isn't done by committee any more than it is by celebrity pronouncements. So we wouldn't care which way a committee voted. 
And we don't care that the story says Michael Mann and another guy said we're trashing the planet anyway. Because science is not done by a show of hands, whether they're waving or clenched into fists. We also note, quote, BC report says climate change brings health risk as doctor fears colossal harms, end quote, which sounds bad. Then we're assured that, quote, Dr. Michael Schwant, a medical health officer with Vancouver Coastal Health, said events like the 2021 heat dome aren't expected to happen in a given summer, but we need to be prepared for something like that every single summer going forward, end quote. So it's not going to happen, but it is. Run in circles, scream and shout. Especially because apparently we're all going to roast, with The Guardian panicking that, quote, heat waves are killing people in increasing numbers and governments have a duty to warn their citizens of the risks, end quote, because apparently dopey ordinary people don't know from heat stroke. However, it turns out that a heat wave in Sweden means it's over 25 degrees Celsius for five days and on the Scottish borders that it's over that number for three which might startle the Scots with their habitual alternation in weather between horizontal and vertical rain, but it's unlikely to lay them in the dust or the heather in vast numbers. Oh, and over at the New York Times, Peter Coy asks cheerily, quote, why don't we just ban fossil fuels, end quote, pointing out that, after all, we ban arson. And then he answers his own question and his silly metaphor with, quote, Unlike arson, the combustion of oil, natural gas, coal, and other fossil fuels provides real benefits, running our cars, heating and cooling our homes, and so on, end quote. But then he thinks, yeah, who needs that stuff? Quote, a ban or severe restriction isn't entirely crazy either if it's phased in as part of a long-term plan to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases to zero. Why not? We've banned things before, end quote. Yeah. At one point, the United States banned alcohol, currently bans a lot of drugs. How's that working out for you? And then we note a story that says, quote, after decades of Arctic sea ice getting faster, models suggest a dramatic reversal is coming, end quote. And apparently, sea ice getting faster is bad because it creates navigational hazards for all that Arctic shipping you don't see out there, but it getting slower is bad too because it means it's all melting and we're all going to die. For sure, as, quote, some models suggest that the slowdown will start within the next decade, while others suggest it will start toward the end of this century, end quote. So, in fact, we have no idea at all what's going to happen, but we do know that it will be bad because it's climate change. Ah, and now we do pop a cork. Because John Kerry is finally stepping down as jet-setting pointless special U.S. presidential envoy on climate, frustrated that humanity in general, and Americans in particular, were not worthy of his benedictions. Having been Massachusetts lieutenant governor, senator, presidential candidate, secretary of state, and special envoy, he sighs, quote, our politics are embarrassing, end quote. After roaming the globe, failing to get people on board, he tells the New York Times' David Wallace Wells that, quote, everybody seems to be locked into a place of indifference, end quote. And yes, here at CDN, we are indifferent to what John Kerry has to say. But everyone he's been jet-setting with seems to care very much about it. They can't shut up about it, even if they have no inclination to do anything other than talk, and even if he just failed conspicuously in his vital role of getting them to act. Still, the same John Kerry explains to the New York Times' as David Wallace Wells that solving the climate crisis is simple. You just have to stop letting countries make their own decisions. Quote, That is why I really believe Dubai was exciting and really different. In Paris, we had to settle for every country going out and writing its own nationally determined contribution, a commitment to do only what it wanted to do, end quote. But a bit of sleep deprivation and browbeating can solve all that. Quote, in Dubai, we succeeded in the dead hours of night in getting people to sign off on the tra transition away from fossil fuel, end quote. Now, unfortunately, getting signatures from a room full of groggy delegates desperate to leave is one thing, and overcoming reality turns out to be quite another. By the way, Kerry also insists that China is probably secretly on board. But, uh, speaking of China, there are people to whom patriotism seems embarrassing, and they include Canada's Trudeau administration, which is working overtime to conceal from the public the degree of their complicity in concealing Chinese communist espionage at our only top-level biohazard lab, which was shipping lethal variants straight to, oh dear, the Wuhan Institute of Virology. But here's another major issue. A crucial aspect of this fabled clean energy transition, on the other side of which, as Kerry put it, quote, is a better world, cleaner, safer, healthier, more secure, end quote, 
is finding energy storage systems to deal with the tendency of wind and solar to produce unevenly and at the wrong times. And unfortunately, the world of BAS, which is battery energy storage systems, is dominated by China. So, shall we embed their technology, including command and control systems, right in the heart of our vital energy grid and then trust in a geopolitical crisis over maybe Taiwan? They would never ever think of turning the power off until we surrender? Well, the Americans are getting wary. But in Canada, yeah, not so much, given Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's openly professed admiration for China's basic dictatorship that could allegedly cram a green agenda down the throats of its citizens in ways that Canada's pesky democracy makes rather difficult. Ah, and in our Getting Worse series, we showed last week, courtesy of Roger Pelkey Jr., that you could make a graph showing climate-related disasters in Europe are getting worse and worse, but you could only do it by ignoring the fact that economies are getting larger, so there's more stuff, and more valuable stuff, in the path of whatever storm comes along. So this week, we re revisit the subject, but we broaden our look to the world as a whole, much of which, of course, is not as wealthy and resilient as Europe. But once again, we turn to Pilkey Jr., because he's crunched the numbers. And yes, adjusting the amounts involved for inflation does yield an upward sloping line in absolute losses. But, as he's noted many times, these data also need to be adjusted for the growth in the economy, specifically showing them as a percentage of GDP. And it's not just we deniers. Even the UN says that's the right way to do it. And for once, the UN is right. And if you do do it that way, the graph looks like this. Yes, we have no upward trend. On the contrary, disaster losses around the world, as a share of humanity's total wealth production, continue to go down. Even if there are just as many storms as before, and despite there being more stuff in their paths. And elsewhere, Pilkey Jr. notes that deaths per 100,000 people from weather and climate disasters are also declining and may well be at their lowest level in human history, even though the alarmists keep telling you climate change is here, it's a disaster, it's wrecking the infrastructure, and it's killing people. The facts just say otherwise. Economic growth is not causing a climate emergency. The climate has always been dangerous, but economic growth is making it safer and safer, and it will continue to do so unless governments, in the name of protecting us, cripple growth and put us in harm's way. Now, here is a hot one. We were recently reminded of a discussion on Twitter, now X, about a year ago, involving hockey stick slayer Steve McIntyre and several anonymous math geeks who'd figured out the latest IPCC trick for making hockey sticks out of nothing. And now, a new blog post at Judith Curry's Climate Etc. by a young writer who goes by the name Hakonsk reviews the new 2,000-year-long hockey stick graph in the last IPCC report in this light. And the whole post is worth reading, especially because he digs up some honest quotations from experts in the field who objected to the IPCC cherry-picking evidence, understating uncertainties, and that sort of thing. But he also shows how McIntyre and company did some remarkable data sleuthing on the latest batch of tree ring chronologies that, in their raw form, have no trend at all, but after processing, display a sharp upward blade in their last few years. After diagnosing a flaw in the processing, McIntyre and his associates offered a simple, devastating proof that the blade is an artifact. What they did is they chopped off the last 25 years of the tree ring data, which removes the current blade altogether, and then they reran the algorithm. And obviously, what should happen is that you would get the same flat line as you had in that graph until you get to the last 25 years. Instead, the computer stuck the blade back on, just shifted back 25 years. What this shows, and it is a devastating finding, is that the computers are programmed to find a hockey stick shape in any data whatsoever. They'd either put one in at the end of the supposedly non-existent medieval warm period if you fed them that data. But it's not how science is done, or at least not how it should be. And finally, from the CO2Science.org archive, a group of researchers analyzed the composition of air bubbles trapped in glacial ice cores from the Taylor Dome area of Antarctica, looking at the age of the bubbles, the isotopic composition of the carbon and the carbon dioxide, and so on, and then they used this data to reconstruct the history of carbon exchanges among the atmosphere, the oceans, and the land over the past 11,000 years, and what they found is, perhaps unsurprisingly, but these days you never know, the warm and moist early Holocene was called optimum for a reason. Warmth is good for life. 
for the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson, and I don't believe floods, drought, or fungus are recent inventions. Unlike that hockey stick blade. Thank you.